Hi, this is JJ DiGeronimo, the president of Tech Savvy Women and Purposeful Woman. Today, for our Women in STEM series, we are interviewing Natalie Panic. She is our first robotic operator and aerospace engineer who works for MDA Space Mission. Natalie has a very colorful background. She has really pushed the limits in a lot of areas that many women would probably be fearful of. Uh, she's driven the first power card across North America. She has a pilot's license and she skydived with the first Korean astronaut. Natalie, welcome to Women in STEM. Thank you so much for having me. We are so excited. Your background is so wonderful. I can't even wait to dive in. So, you know, let's go back a little bit. How did you even get into robotics and aerospace? It's kind of just been a lucky run of being involved in projects that innovate for extreme environments. I've always had this dream of traveling to space and wanting to be an astronaut. So. I went and got a mechanical engineering degree. I figured that would be a good place to start and would give me lots of options to go from there. So then I got an aerospace engineering degree. I did my master's studying combustion and microgravity. I lucked out with a couple of internships at NASA and then ended up getting a job at MDA Space Missions, which is the company that built the Canada Arms. So they have a, a niche in robotic operations and building robotic manipulators. Wow. So, you know, as a young girl, did you have somebody motivating you in this area? Because many girls, that's not top of mind for them. I don't know if I specifically had anyone motivating me to go into a STEM field, but my parents always pushed me to do what I love, do what I'm passionate about, and to really challenge my limits and always want to be involved in something where I'm learning a lot. That is great. And are either one of them in the STEM field? Actually, no. Well, my dad, he, he, he runs a company and his background is in environmental science and same with my brother, but no one in engineering or technology fields. That is great. And so when you got into school, uh, when you started attending school, were you one of the only women in the classes you attended? When you do your engineering degree, everybody kind of goes into a general field in your first year, so there's definitely more girls. But then because I went into mechanical, that discipline tech usually has less women in it. So I was about 10 out of 140 women. So the ratio is quite small, but other engineering disciplines like chemical or civil or uh, even geomatics engineering usually have about a 50-50 ratio. And what school did you attend? I did my bachelor's at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada, and then my master's at the University of Toronto in Canada as well. That is awesome. And so did you feel like there's always, you know, women always talk about, well, I just because, you know, in your field, there wasn't even 10% were women. So did you feel, did that inspire you? Or did you even really even think about being uh, just a few women in such a, you know, dominant, male dominant uh, degree? I think anyone going through engineering knows that it's a very difficult degree to do. You're always doing labs and homework and assignments and you're constantly at the university. So it's more about working together with the people around you, trying to get all your work done and get your degree than really thinking about any limitations or difficulties that you would have. So you're really focused on the work. Yeah, just trying to really succeed and make the most of your education. Mm -hmm. And through school, what kept you motivated? What did you do to sort of keep yourself whole and sort of energized to keep going? I think an important part when you're going through school is to just try and be well balanced. So I was saying how engineering is such a, a difficult degree and you're always in school, but if you make time for extracurricular activities, like I love hiking and I love being outdoors. So anytime I wasn't at school, that's where I tried to spend a lot of my time just to clear your head and kind of de-stress from everything. Yeah, I agree. I think even women that are much older than you still are challenged with that. So the fact that you started early, finding some balance and some things to do outside of your profession is, is probably very helpful. Exactly. So we'll get into some of the cool things that you've done, but let's talk a little bit about how you ob obtained your first internship. Was it through a connection? Did you apply? How did you really get a hold of an internship while, uh, while achieving your degrees? So at the University of Calgary, you can do an internship as part of your program. So I did a 16-month internship at an oil and gas company, which wasn't exactly my passion or what I wanted to do, but it provided me with the resources to get my pilot's license. So that all worked out well. And then my internship at NASA, my first one, was actually all about persistence. Uh, the Canadian Space Agency selects one Canadian to go attend a NASA academy in the States. 
So I had applied four times for the program and I got rejected all four times. And on the fourth time, I had decided that was enough. So I called the director of higher education at NASA Goddard and asked him about the internship and for any feedback on my application, why I hadn't been selected. And I'm not sure what the reasoning was, but he had offered me a position right there on the spot if I could find my own funding. So I did and I went to Goddard and it was one of the most amazing summers ever. I have to hit the pause button because that nugget of information is so powerful for so many women young and old. So not only did you apply once and get declined, but you applied four times, four times. And then when you were declined the fourth time, you did not take no for an answer. You (laughs) found the number, right, to somebody. I don't know how you even got the number. Did you find that on the internet? I just Googled and then found the number and didn't think anyone would answer when I called, but they did. (laughs) So you Googled the number, you found a number, and you just cold called someone and basically said, you know, I was wondering why I haven't gotten one of these internships. And on the spot, after they reviewed your information, they must have pulled it up or something, Mm -hmm. they basically offered you an internship, not with pay, but said if you can get here. I mean, the tenacity of that. You should be so proud of yourself. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that and it. I think that made the summer more rewarding. So many people would have said, you know, would have stopped at the first no. And I always tell people that every no is closer to a yes. But this story, I think, is so important uh, for so many women because so many of us are told no one time and that's it. We stop trying. Well yep. done. <laughs> well done. I can't even wait to hear the rest. Okay, so you finish your internships and uh, then what? How do you get your first job? Uh, So, well, after my first internship at NASA Goddard, I applied for a space studies program through the International Space University. And I was selected for that as a Canadian to go down to NASA Ames Research Center. And I ended up working on a mission to Mars. So it was really neat because usually in a Mars mission, they want to send crew members to live on the surface of the planet. But we were looking into if we could send astronauts to Mars and live under the lava tubes under the surface. So it would be like they were living in caves. So that was a really neat concept. And then after I finished that, I, I was finished my master's as well. So I needed a job and I applied to MDA space missions in Canada. And here you are. Yep. Yeah. So what do you think about the corporate world? What do you think about working? I mean, is it what you thought it was going to be? I ended up getting hired onto a very neat program called the Next Generation Canada Arm. So the essence of the program is on-orbit satellite servicing. It's this catalyst for uh, being able to send robotic arms up into space to repair satellites that have broken down or run out of fuel. So being more conscious of what's becoming space debris and what we can be reusing. And I got to stay on that program for the entire life cycle. So from the start and then three years later to the finish where I was actually operating the robot at a mission control station and giving demos to NASA and the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, Canadian Space Agency, SpaceX, DARPA. So it was an incredible opportunity to be hired into that. Wow. I'm in awe. I really am for your age and what you've accomplished. I mean, girl, well done. Thank you. (laughs) That is amazing. So what have you learned about yourself in this whole, you know, where you've come from, where you are now? What are some of the things you've learned about yourself that maybe either you wish you had known earlier or that is going to help you move forward? I always, when I'm doing talks, relate to one of my favorite books, which is called Failure is Not an Option by Gene Kranz, who's, who was a NASA flight director during the Apollo era. And he has this list called the Foundations of Mission Control, which he came up to make sure that his team of engineers and scientists got those men safely to the moon and back. And they were foundations of teamwork, toughness, competence, responsibility, and confidence. And I think those have been fundamental in how far I've come and how far I hope to go. Wow, I love it. I'm going to make sure I write the book down so it's in your uh, summary. But, um, you know, you do a lot of, um, I want to talk a little bit about how you give back. It seems like you do a lot of events around your area and then beyond. Can you talk a little bit about how you're already giving back? Sure. When I was going through my degree, I didn't really have any female professors. Uh, When I got my pilot's license, I was lucky enough to have the only female instructor. And then just after a while, I realized that I've built up these amazing experiences and that I can be passing along 
what I've learned along the way to a younger generation because I was always looking for mentors and there weren't very many. So I can easily make myself accessible to the next generation of women and try to inspire them to pursue challenging careers as well. That is great. That is great. I know we have some some highlights of that. And then what are you doing these days to stay balanced? Because it seems like things are, you know, expanding and growing and, you know, there's a lot more exposure now than you had in college. So what do you do now to stay balanced and really start to to do things in your personal life? Uh, I still do lots of hiking and camping as much as I can do lots of traveling. I'm going to Ushuaia, Argentina in November, so all the way down to the southern tip to Cape Horn. I play ultimate frisbee. Um, I love to read. I never really had time to read to read u- during university, so it's nice now to have that luxury. That is wonderful. And so just a few last questions. You know, when you think about the women coming up, you know, what advice would you give them knowing where you ended up? The advice I would give them to the next generation of women is not to be afraid to take risks and just to dive head on into whatever they're doing and to to try and find situations where they can learn to be innovative and learn to work with technology. I think that's wonderful. And, you know, what's on the horizon for you? You've already accomplished so much and you're not even 30 yet. So, I mean, the sky's the limit, but what is on the agenda for you, Natalie? Oh, goodness. To be honest, I don't even know. Right now, I'm having a lot of fun with some speaking opportunities that have come up. I just did one in Calgary at a uh, an agro festival called Beakerhead, which was a merger of arts and science and engineering. And I met... Uh, a very famous scientist in Canada named Jay Ingram who hosted a a long-running television show on Discovery Channel. So I think there might be opportunities to do some work with that festival in the future and we'll see what happens. That's great. And then what is your professional goals? My professional goals are to continue making a mark in the aerospace industry, maybe take on more project management roles and get my hands wet and actually leading a project. And are you interested with all of the work you've done around space? Are you interested in going up in space? Still, that is still my goal to get up there one day. But it's a lifelong goal. I have lots of things I want to do here on Earth still. So I'll just keep building a tool belt of skills that hopefully will one day get me there. That is wonderful. And do you have any last words of advice or thoughts that you want to share that you think that women uh, interested in pursuing STEM or women that are already in STEM uh, would benefit from? I think one of the things that's most important is not to focus on the hardships that women in technology face or the obstacles. I think we need to focus on why women involved in technology love what they do and in doing so inspire the next generation of women and also to have fun while you're doing it. I could not agree more and you know this really is the reason for this video series is to showcase all the diversity all the different routes women take and what it has done for their lives and what it has done for their professional journeys and you really uh, have showcased a marvelous story and I could not be more thrilled to include you in our women in stem video series oh thank you very much for having me oh Natalie all the best to you I hope you will keep in touch and keep us posted on your successes Definitely will. Thank you. And for anyone who's listening, uh, they will be able to reach out to Natalie through her social media pages. And if you are a woman in STEM and interested in sharing your story, please be sure to contact us. Thank you again, Natalie. Thank you so much.